to do that, let's go back to the original Crimean War um, and why Crimea is still and always has been and is still of interest to Russia. Now, in the 1850s, so about the time that we were um, embroiled in a civil war um, in the United States just before, um, there was the Crimean War. Now, you can tell from this map here that um, Russia uh, ha would have interest in the um, peninsula known as, the, as Crimea. Now, at the time, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Ottoman Empire, in fact, had control over the Crimean Peninsula. In fact, the Ottoman Empire controlled much of the Black Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and south of um, the, uh, in, not pictured in the map, the Red Sea. This is, this is, these were all the strategic trading routes um, around um, this, uh, the European, Middle Eastern, and um, Central Asian part of the world. And one of the things that Russia would wanted was Russia wanted a, um, a warm water port to the south. Now, if you see that if Russia wanted to launch battleships or even trading ships, um, in uh, its options were up in the north east, uh, to the northwest, the Baltic Sea. Okay, this Baltic Sea, as you can imagine, is very cold, and in, sometimes during winter the ports would ice over. So it wanted what it was called a, a warm water port to the south that would always have access um, to the oceans if it needed it. <clears throat> as a result, in, 18, in the 1850s, Russia went to war against the Ottoman Empire so as to gain this Crimean Peninsula. In uh, the end, the Ottoman Empire won, in part because Great Britain and France came to its aid in order to protect Russia, from, uh, or to prevent Russia from controlling a warm water port and having more access to these trading routes. In the 1970s, the USSR <clears throat> became very powerful towards the end of World War I um, and annexed Crimea. Um, Ottoman Empire entered the war, um, World War I, on the side of Germany, and as you know, lost, and so it was quite weak at this point. And so the Soviet Union took advantage of um, this weakened Ottoman Empire and annexed uh, Crimea. In 1992, after the Soviet Union fell, Crimea became a part of Ukraine, a newly independent country. Okay, so outside, out of the Soviet Union were born several states, and Ukraine was one of them. And as you can see in the bottom map, Ukraine was, is a very large um, neighbor of Russia, former Soviet Union um, uh, puppet state, and it became a newly independent state. And Crimea is the Yellow Peninsula um, in the map um, below. Crimea, well, I'll start with Ukraine, before 2014, has a bit of an identity crisis, and this goes back centuries. Ukraine has um, been under the Russian Empire and then later under the Soviet Union, yet it has really kind of, there are really honestly two Ukraines. As you can see from the map um, in the top right-hand corner, Ukraine has this kind of the yellow part, which is considered to be more pro-European in orientation. Um, this part had, um, was... Uh, uh, conquered at times by Austria um, and Poland, and so it tends to lean a little bit more Western in orientation. After 1992, after uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, it became to be a little bit more Western in association. Southern Ukraine, in contrast, tends to be more pro-Russian. In fact, um, during the Soviet Union, Stalin um, uh, exposed ex expelled or exterminated many Ukrainians and encouraged Russian, ethnic Russians, to um, inhabit the so southeastern portion of Ukraine. So there are strong ethnic ties to Russia in the blue areas in the south, including Crimea. This comes into play in current politics. In 2010, a pro-Russian um, leader, Yanukovych, came to power. Okay, and Yanukovych Tried, its, tried his best to kind of handle these two Ukraines, but ultimately he was pro-Russian and he leaned towards Russia. The clearest example was in 2013, Ukraine was in talks with the European Union so to have a trade agreement um, with uh, Europe, the European Union that would lean Ukraine away from Russia and become more dependent on trade with the European Union. In 2013, Yanukovych in, in talks with uh, Putin decided to reject the European agreement and instead enter into a, a new, several new agreements with Russia. 
This started chaos throughout Ukraine. Specifically in winter of 2013-2014, the Euromaidan protests began. Euromaidan is pro-EU um, protests, began throughout Ukraine specifically and most, most notably in the yellow areas in the north. Um, there's uh, pictures here um, on the bottom left is a very important one. This was the actual square um, where the protests began. And originally, um, as you can see in the middle, there were peaceful protests, people waving um, uh, European um, Union flags and many and Ukrainian flags. And many of them um, were students like you coming to protest that their uh, government was um, still acting as if it were a puppet for Russia is how they uh, oftentimes vocalized it. What's so um, important to remember about these protests is that they quickly turned violent. Um, as you can see from the left, um, this is the square before the protest and after the protest. Um, Yanukovych's government decided to violently suppress these protests. So what began as, pe began as peaceful protests were met with violent um, responses by the government and ultimately the protesters turned violent in, re in response. Um, I don't usually plug documentaries and I want to highlight that this documentary is um, extremely biased and I don't see that biased and I don't see that as a, a negative, I don't mean that in a negative connotation. Um, but Winter on Fire is something you can view on uh, Netflix and it's um, home uh, footage uh, of the protest from the protesters perspective and, and of the violence from the protesters perspective. Um, again, it is not from the Ukrainian government perspective, so you will have to take that into account. But it's really interesting if you want to see a one-sided view of the Ukrainian civil war, ultimately, that erupted in 2013-2014. Crimea. Okay, I've been talking to you about all of Ukraine erupting in a civil war um, after the protests began in kind of the yellow area. Well, let's talk about the blue area. In the blue area to the south, these, um, this area really remained kind of pro-Russian. They supported Yanukovych's decision to reject the European um, agreement, and they supported Yanukovych's decision to kind of lean towards Russia. They understand themselves as being kindred spirits uh, with Russia, historical allies, historically a part of the Soviet Union, and they saw Yanukovych's moves as good ones. Okay. Well, after the protests turned bloody, Yanukovych feared for his life, and so he fled from Kiev in the north, in the yellow part, to Crimea, to the blue part, where he knew that he would have, be surrounded by supporters. Okay? In response, the government that remained in Kiev, the pro-European government, elected a new leader. And uh, since the old leader was in absentia, they elected a new leader. There was no constitutional um, uh, precedence for this. And so many say that this was not legally done. The pro-European government was uh, they elected was Poroshenko. Um, Poroshenko is still the leader, um, technically, of Ukraine, though many believe that the leader um, uh, of Ukraine technically is still Yanukovych. So there's a bit of a dispute. Um, what does this have to do with Russia? Well, Russia saw that as Ukraine was, was erupting into civil war, um, Russia was concerned about its own interest. Many say it was an opportunistic time. Many say that Russia felt threatened. Either way, Russia decides to enter Crimea. Okay, thus from I love political cartoons, and these are there's this uh, video has a lot of political cartoons in it. But Russia, the classic symbol of Russia is the bear, enters Crimea um, to catch the fish and says, "I'm saving you from drowning." The first reports of Russia entering Ukraine were what was called local defense forces. Okay, now initial reports, and these are the the, the images that you um, that were initially reported. Um, many said, "Oh, the, you know, this is a Ukrainian issue, and yet we see Russian forces entering Ukraine." Well, when Putin, the leader of Russia, was asked about this, he said, "Oh, no, no, these are not." Um, Russian forces entering Ukraine. These are local defense forces, militia, people who just were bakers by day, picking up um, arms against their government, so in the blue, picking up arms against their yellow, their pro-European government in order to defend their rights, in order to defend Yanukovych. 
And in response, the international community said, um, these are not local militia. I mean, if you look at this, local militia tend to have um, people 16 to 55 all enlist, just, you know, and, they, and they're haphazard. They're whatever armaments they happen to have um, on hand or in their local um, supply stores. They're not well organized, at least not initially. And all of the reports showed, and smartphone pictures um, showed, that these people were in fact well armed. They had tanks, they were well uniformed, um, and many said that they were in fact Russian officials. Um, though the patches that usually showed the Russian flag had been removed, and the tags that were Russian tags had been removed from the tanks. The international community decided to um, uh, issue a strong condemnation of Putin's actions, um, and so it said it's a violation of Ukrainian sovereignty, and the U.S. voted to impose smart sanctions against Russia. Smart sanctions mean that you only impose sanctions not on the full country, not even on full economic sectors, but instead only certain officials. Um, you freeze their accounts if they have any investment, uh, any accounts or investments in the United States, and you um, don't allow travel visas for them, just kind of a, a scalpel rather than a big saw, a way of just trying to punish just the few leaders in control of, um, of Russia at the time. After the international community issued its strong condemnation against Russia invading Ukraine, um, at least you know, Russia continued to deny that it was actually sending its forces, although the local defense forces looked more and more like Russian officials. Um, the international community showed that it was not willing to invade um, or to get involved militarily in order to back Russia out of Ukraine. Um, actually, our own Be Jeff Berezikian, a professor here, was interviewed by the Ukrainian officials, and the Ukrainian officials asked him when was the U.S. going to get involved? And it was up to him um, to look them in the eye and say, perhaps never. Um, we did the calculus and we were very war weary, right? We've had long wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and we are at this time uh, realized that it was just not a mu as much of a national security issue for us that we could justify getting involved. Um, the European Union also, whereas it supported um, the initial agreement with Ukraine, it also depends on Russia for a lot of its oil, and so was unwilling to kind of really punish Russia militarily for having invaded Ukraine. So, as the Russia's calculus, as Russian calculus realized that it wasn't um, going to be stopped by the international community, all of a sudden then Russian forces, actual official forces, started entering, um, no longer with passages hidden, no longer with um, license plates uh, taken off. Um, tanks started rolling in and officials started rolling in. And the official word by, from the Russian officials was that it, they were providing humanitarian aid to protect ethnic Russians from pro-European government, from its pro-European government. Um, after the Russian officials uh, really kind of became fully incorporated into Crimea um, and occupied Crimea, the um, Crimean provincial government decided to hold a referendum in which they would allow every Crimean to vote on whether they wanted to remain with Ukraine or go with Russia. Well, an outstandingly and almost unbelievably 96.7% of Crimeans voted to go with Russia. And many suggest, as this political cartoon criticizes, that um, it was Putin's occupation that really kind of intimidated people into coming out and voting and voting in favor of Russia, whether they really wanted to be part of Russia or not. As a result, still to this day, um, Crimea is considered to have been, by the international community, illegally obtained um, in an illegal referendum um, by Russia and is now considered to be, by de facto, um, a part of Russia.